Gary, thank you so much for making the time. You're welcome, Kathy. We have so much in common. I'm looking forward to this discussion. <laughs> I love that you think that we have so much in common. I, uh, I would like to think so. Um, I've certainly been well, on the path. First of all, first of all, we're human. And secondly, that means that we all have frightened and loving parts of our personalities. And the frightened parts, like the parts that are angry and jealous and resentful and righteous and competitive, hurt and cause painful, destructive consequences. And the loving parts, like those parts that are grateful and appreciative and caring and content, feel wonderful. And they create constructive consequences. And so we have all of that in common because it's impossible to be in the earth school without having these frightened and loving parts of your personality. And it's impossible to experience the frightened parts without experiencing pain. And if you're not experiencing the pain, then you're trying to cover up the pain that you're not experiencing. And that's when, if you're me or I, and like most people, that's when you shout, withdraw, judge, uh, become vindictive, uh, want to shrivel up and disappear, or want to get blustery. And in order to avoid all that, you have to experience the pain. This is a life in the earth school. And it's unprecedented now in its potential. So that's what I think we have in common. And also, as I was looking over your website and what you do, you're uh, supporting people in finding their purpose, which means to me, finding that which is most meaningful and experimenting with it, and then moving in that direction instead of maybe the direction that your mom or your dad or your preacher or your peers want you to move, but yeah. where you want to move, because that's the only place in my experience that I can find meaning. Mm, and so beautiful, and it's so like you to start off like this, so with so much humility and so much wisdom. I find that a lot of our listeners get really caught in this feeling of not being enough and what you just said about what we have in common, right? At first I was sort of like caught off guard, like you have sold millions and millions of books and you were on Oprah, I think more time than anybody else. And you're, you know, I think that that's what happens to people is the difference between how I was looking at it and how you were looking at it is you're stepping back into like looking at us as souls, looking at us on this journey in earth school, as you said, so beautifully. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the sort of the, what I first found to be just so remarkable about your work, which is really helping people understand how to connect with who they really are, who we really are as souls, because boy, does that help us find our way to what it is that we're really meant to do. And I've never heard anyone articulate it as well as you have. Well, thank you so much, Kathy. I'll, uh, I, I love to talk about these things. And first I wanna suggest to all of our listeners that uh, what I enjoy sharing is a window through which I've come to see life. But I don't ask that you see it that way. And I suggest that you not accept anything that I say is true because I say it, or anything that anybody says as true because they say it. Uh, even if they have a television program or um, a pulpit or a church or they've written some books, try it on for yourself if you resonate with it. And if you do, experiment with it. And if that works for you, which means bring you toward meaning, toward fulfillment, then do it some more. And if not, throw it away. Don't try to wear a shoe that pinches. So given that, uh, I feel that we are in a time of unprecedented transformation. By we, I mean all of us. We are in a period of transition in which an old consciousness has died and it's 
overhang, so to speak, of inertia and momentum is still with us every day in every way around us, wherever we look. And a new consciousness has been born. And it's born in us. It's touching hundreds of millions of people now. And within a few generations, everyone will have this new consciousness. So now, uh, and, and people who are listening to your podcast and are coming to you because you're encouraging them to find meaning are people in whom this new consciousness has emerged. L let me explain it a little more so that you, you can see if that really fits. The old consciousness was one in which we thought we were minds and bodies. And we thought that power was the ability to manipulate and to control. The new consciousness is one in which our awareness has been expanded beyond the perceptions of the five senses. So now we have another sensory system in addition to the sensory system of the five senses. And we can call it, so we become multi-sensory, put it that way. And have you ever had the experience? I'm speaking now to our listeners as well as to you, but I have a suspicion that you have had these experiences very much. Uh, that you are more than a mind and a body. Absolutely. Yes. That's a multi-sensory perception. Uh, have you had the experience that this world that we're in is not random? There's something about it that's meaningful. Now and then mm -hmm. we see something meaningful and we call it synchronistic. And now and then we get the hunch, maybe it's all that way. And now and then we can see it. That's a multi-sensory perception. And if you're like me, when I was in high school, I took my only science class. It was physics. I did not like it in the least. It told me that the universe is vast, cold, merciless, random, and inert, which means dead. And now, have you ever had the thought Maybe the universe is compassionate and wise. Even if that is incomprehensible to your mind in the moment, how could the things that are happening, so much starvation and poverty and brutality and manipulation, be part of a wise and compassionate universe? And against all reasoning, something still suggests that to you. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's more. Maybe... It's alive. That's a multi-sensory perception. So to all of our listeners, if any of this resonates with you, you're in the right place. And the right place is the Earth School. And this Earth School existed before you were born, of course. It will exist after you die, of course. But what multi-sensory perception shows you is that you... Oh, you with a big, big Y, not a little Y. That you existed before you with a little Y were born. In other words, that you have an immortal component that existed before you came into the Earth School. You were, your personality was born and will exist after your soul goes home, which is when your personality dies. So the big question is, what are you going to do with this time between your birth date and your death date? How are you going to use this precious experience in physicality, in this domain of time and space and matter and duality? That's what I love talking about. And that's why I accepted your invitation and, <laughs> and to speak with you about these things. What is meaning? Where does it come from? And how can I get it? How can I use it? I love it so much. And I've, I've been saying to my husband, all I want to do every day is somehow plug into the 5D. And over the last 20 years, I've been on a, a search. I was a, a world religions major. And then I wound up in Jerusalem for three years studying Kabbalah and then went to the UCLA Mindful Center for a couple of years and then got involved in Joe Dispenza's work. And of course, found you within that time. And what I find fascinating is just how often um, 
And I think it's because we don't really understand the way that the brain sort of hardwires us into the past and into all this lower vibrational stuff, fear, shame, doubt. And when you speak, it's so integrated into the, into the fabric of your being that just being in your presence, just listening to you, people get shot out of that sort of limited place. And we, we start to feel into this higher elevated frequency. But if we're not sitting in front of you or reading the lines of your beautiful books, how can we do this? How can we wake up in the morning and get out of this sort of old past limited thing, which is so married to a narrative and a story that isn't in alignment with any of the, the truth of this like bigger expansive reality, which is who we really are. How do we plug into that? How do we get there? That's what we're talking about. The new understanding of power is the alignment of your personality with your soul. That statement is only understandable to someone who's touched multi-sensory perception or it's touched them. Forty years ago, our parents would not have understood these things because five sensory humans don't have any experience that they can use to hook on to a sentence like that. But multi-sensory humans do. They register. Just like you said, they register something and it puts them in a different place. The different place is the new consciousness. Now the new consciousness is a gift from the universe. We don't have to develop it, although we will. All we need to do really is unwrap it and use it. The potential of the new consciousness is the new power. Alignment of the part of your personality with your soul. The intentions of your soul are harmony, cooperation, sharing, reverence for life. So your question is, how do you do that? The only way that I know is to find every part of your personality that opposes that. Those are the parts that we already mentioned, the parts that are angry, jealous, resentful, competitive, uh, that are manic or depressed, that are com compulsive, obsessive, or addictive. Find every one of those. Experience it fully. In other words, these are your painful emotional experiences. That's how this comes to you. Experience it fully. Never suppress, repress, or deny an emotion. Feel it in the fullness of emotional awareness, which means somatically in terms of your body. Look at your thoughts, its thoughts, the thoughts of this frightened part of your personality that hurts in your chest, that hurts in your solar plexus, or hurts in your throat. Experience it, and then in that moment, reach for the healthiest part of your personality that you can. That's where contentment and meaning and joy are waiting for you. And in that moment, you might not be able to. I usually can't. You might not even be able to remember one. So strive to remember one. Strive to remember a time when you were grateful when you are really appreciative for your life. Like Kathy, you can look back and say, that time when I was writing songs, that time when I was uh, being introduced to ads and film, that time when I uh, got introduced to Oprah, that time when I reached for that, a time when you felt good about your life. Because when you do, you move yourself in that direction. You move yourself away from fear and into the direction of love. And when you do that again and again and again repeatedly, you begin to move beyond the control of those parts of your personality that are frightened and painful. And love enters your awareness more and more. And as it does, meaning enters your life more and more. So... Wow. You, you have expertise in this because you've talked to so many people who are looking for meaning and you've also explored and found a lot of it in your life. And you know, as I do, 
that meaning is your compass. Meaning is the compass that always points in the direction that your soul wants to travel. And when you travel in that direction, meaning comes into your life. And when you travel in the opposite direction, your life empties of meaning. And you think, is this all there is? Yeah, that totally makes me cry. I feel like tears are your soul's way of saying, that's so true. That feels so oh. true, you know? Um, I remember when I first found you, I was just so blown away by love, how much you love so unconditionally, just who you are and how everyone who gets to meet you, that's the gift that you give every person is a genuine, they walk away with a genuine feeling of love. And I remember hearing Oprah say to you at that taping at Royce Hall, she said, I had been looking everywhere for answers. And she says, your book completely stopped me in my tracks and changed the way I fundamentally saw the world. And she, she spoke about in Seed of the Soul. And of course, we're going to get to your newest book because it's coming out very soon. And that's what we're going to talk about, of course. But to go back to what she said, it was so powerful. She said she was reading Seed of the Soul and she, she understood as you, as you teach that our job in the search for meaning is to point our ship, our soul in the direction of the mothership, right? Like all the, we soul, the soul is the mothership and we are little boats in a fleet of little boats around the mothership. And every little boat has a captain and a crew. Your personality is one of those little boats <laughs> in the fleet around the ship, the mothership that is your soul. So you determine the direction your little boat moves. And you are responsible for where it moves. Now some of the crew, every boat has a crew. Some of the crew are cooperative. They're fun to be with. They love life. They love the voyage. They love sailing. They do anything they can to support one another and to support you, the captain. And there's other crew members you have that don't like any of it. They don't like where they are. They're always trying to be something else, and there isn't any place else, but they keep looking for one anyway. They object to what you suggest. They don't want to go where you want to go. And they're painful. They move right into the, they're right into your face. So creating authentic power is a matter of becoming acquainted intimately with all of your crew members so that you can cultivate the ones that want to work with you going where you want to go and challenge those who are obstructing where you want to go. Those are the frightened are the fear-based parts of your personality. And that is the journey to authentic power. That's life in the Earth School. And by the way, thank you for uh, describing me as someone who's always loving. At heart, I am, as are you, as is everyone who's listening to us, but frightened parts of my personality obstruct that at times. Uh, just ask my spiritual partner, Linda Francis. <laughs> anyone who's lived together oh, for even six months knows that it's difficult but if you live together longer it becomes even more difficult and more rewarding and if you live together long enough with the intention to grow spiritually not to save your relationship not to cultivate it but to grow spiritually to use your interactions to develop humbleness and clarity and forgiveness and love, the rewards become immense. I'm still being amazed at how they're unfolding in front of me. But it takes all my courage, the new use of all my courage, to stop a power struggle when I'm in one with Linda. It's so difficult to do. And that's what you develop the ability to do as you explore all the parts of your personality that are longing for power struggles feel righteous and launch into them. Mm. There's nothing wrong with that. The universe doesn't look at 
things in terms of right and wrong or good and bad. It looks at them in terms of cause and effect. Every effect has a cause. And if you participate in the effect, in the cause, pardon me, you will participate in the effect. So I say, why not create effects that are pleasing to experience when you encounter them? Yeah. That, feel, <laughs> that take you where you want to go rather than effects that are so painful that they cause you to react yet again and create more painful effects. And that's what most of us do. It's so powerful what you're saying. So, so powerful and, and so filled with humility, of course. It's just so refreshing. Um, but one of the things that you said before, speaking of refreshing, I've never heard said on the show, we've done over 450 episodes and so many people have come on here who talk about success and goals and mastery. And I haven't heard it said that really what we all want is meaning. That's really what we crave. That's really what feels fulfilling, right? Everything else starts to feel That's right. empty. The frightened parts of our personalities fill that. The loving parts of our personalities don't crave anything. They are loving. They live there. And your opportunity in the earth school is to align yourself with those parts. That's exactly what creating authentic power is. It's interesting because I meet so many people who I would describe as light workers. The women who write to me, who listen to this show, they, they have those kinds of hearts where they want to be generous all the time. They want to give, they want to uh, be, that's all they really want to do is help people. And yet they feel such imposter syndrome. Like, who would I be to actually go get my massage therapy license? Who, who would I be to start a blog? Who would I be? What do I have? How, I, I just find that so frustrating that people have goodness and they seek meaning and then somehow they take themselves out of the running as if they're not a good candidate because they don't have X and Y bestseller or they never went to this school or they're not pretty in this way. And I, I wonder what you would say to those people and is it possible for them to somehow reach for a way that they can give and show up and serve beyond what their ego tells them is possible for them? Well, beyond what the frightened parts of their personality tell them is possible for them. Right. And the answer is yes. We are all good candidates. Right now, there's <laughs> about seven and a half billion of us. You're a good candidate because you're in the Earth School. And that's not a random experience. It's a precious experience. It's an experience that is one of voluntary. It's a voluntary experience. The frightened parts of your personality are the parts that your soul gave your personality as it incarnated into the Earth School, specifically to move beyond the control of. And it also gave to your personality, lent some, the loving parts of it, which are the parts that are already aligned with your soul. In other words, when you cultivate the loving parts, the parts of you that are grateful, appreciative, content, caring, in awe of the universe, you move, you align yourself with your person, your personality with your soul. And when you encounter those parts of your personality that are fear-based, you are encountering your avenues to spiritual growth. They are not your obstacles to spiritual development. They are the parts of your personality that you must use, that you must, and I say must, not like should, you've got to be this, to be right, to be good, to be successful, but if you want to change, <laughs> then you've got to become aware of what in yourself you want to change. And then you've got to apply your free will toward that transformation. That's the bare bones of self-transformation. And creating authentic power is that. 
So whenever you're encountering a part of your personality that tells you, I'm not good enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm too smart, I'm too masculine, I'm not masculine enough, I'm not feminine enough, all of those are expressions of a pain that we all have. That's the pain of powerlessness. The pain of powerlessness is the pain of wanting to belong and not belonging. It's wanting to love and feeling you're not capable of loving. It's wanting to be loved and feeling that you're unlovable. It's seeing yourself as inherently defective, intrinsically flawed. You don't want anyone else to see you the way you see yourself inside because they wouldn't want anything to do with you. And that's excruciating. We all have the pain of powerlessness, every human. In the old consciousness, when we were, <coughs> pardon me, confined to the five senses, we would try to mask the pain of powerlessness by changing the world. That's the pursuit of external power, manipulation and control. If somebody left, we'd find another partner. If a child died, we'd conceive another. If a business failed, we'd find another. We do whatever it takes to mask this unbearable pain. We'd eat, we'd drink, we'd have sex, we'd gamble. We'd become perfectionists, workaholics, and nothing works. That is how we evolved for 300,000 years pursuing external power. It was our good medicine. Now it's poison. It's counterproductive to our evolution. The new power is alignment of your personality with your soul. And it's only by experiencing, unearthing all of the fear-based parts of your personality and experiencing them fully, experiencing the physical sensations of them, say in your for example, in your throat area, your chest area, your solar plexus area. And if you're just saying, oh, I feel good, I feel bubbly, I feel light, I feel heavy, I feel despondent, I feel despairing, that is not the experience of a frightened part of your personality. Those are poetic labels. I'm talking about the physical sensations of fear in you, in your heart area, for example. Physical sensations are so, they stab, burn, churn, throb, ache, contract. So if you look at your chest when you're feeling down, you'll discover that heartache is not poetic. Heartache is real. You feel there's a stabbing in, an area, in the area of your chest. Where? Like in an ice pick? Is it the size of a softball, a golf ball? Where is it? Is it burning? When you uh, look at, when, when you feel you want to express something to somebody and, and, and you think there's no way they're going to hear me because either I can't do it right, I can't express myself, or they're not going to understand. And you put your attention in your throat area <clears throat> or your shoulder area or your temporal mandible joints, your jaws. You'll find physical pain there, contraction. That's emotional awareness. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the two tools, one of the three tools of creating authentic power. And Linda and I co-authored a book called The Heart of the Soul, Emotional Awareness, that'll let you experiment with that. So if until you experience these fear-based parts of your personality in full, and that takes courage and commitment yeah. and compassion, you're in the control of them. And while you're in the control of a fear-based part of your personality, you can't give the gifts you were born to give. How can you give the gifts you were born to give when a fear-based part of your personality is saying, you're ugly. No one wants to be with you. If they could see you the way you really are, <laughs> come on, really? You want to do something in the world? Think again, girl. Think again, fellow. That's the experience. That's a thought of a fear-based part of your personality. And you cannot give the gifts 
while you're in the control of a part like that. You cannot give the gifts you were born to give when you're jealous. You cannot give the gifts that you were born to give when you're caught in the addictive sexual energy current. You, so, your time in the earth go, another way of putting it, is your opportunity to transform yourself so that you give those gifts. And you give them naturally. In other words, authentic power is developing the ability to move through the earth school with an empowered heart without attachment to the outcome. Yeah. Wow. I feel that um, every single word of what you're saying is, it's like medicine. You know, we really, we really need this. And, and one thing I'm curious about is so often once we become aware of something like this, mm -hmm. we think, oh my gosh, well, how much time is that going to take for me to overcome whatever one of the jealousy, fear, shame, doubt about whatever thing it is that's, that's so part of this personality that I have gone over and over again in my neural pathways, right? And lived and breathed. But I've heard it said that in, in spiritual work, it's not always linear, right? It's about like, you know, coming into a different vibration. What can you tell us about like how, how much within reach is it for us to really be able to, to do this work? And does it have to take years or is this something that is, is, is there a potential in the field for us to be able to overcome this? And if so, how can we make that manifest? This is doable. That's why we're talking together on this show. And the potential is not in a field somewhere. It's in you. And how long will it take? That depends. Creating authentic power is not easy. It requires commitment and courage and compassion and conscious communication and actions. These are the authentic power guidelines, and you can get them on our website. Just download them. How much time is it, is it going to take? So if somebody thinks that, they think, uh, well, I don't know. I don't know. I was planning a vacation next summer. <laughs> How much time is it worth to you to be free of the terrible pain of, the, of powerlessness. Yeah. How much time is it worth to you to move past the part of you that feels inferior and needs to please? How much time is it worth to you to move beyond the control of a frightened part of your personality, like I was in for decades, that feels superior and entitled and angry? How much time do you have to spend? What else do you have to spend? That's why you're in the earth school. Can you do it in this lifetime? Yes. Will you do it in this lifetime? That's for you to decide. You have been experiencing this pain, the pain of frightened parts of your personality for lifetimes, sometimes without number. The Buddhist, as, as well as Hindus, everyone who believes, maybe not really practices that belief, but believes in reincarnation, understands that consciousness and responsibility for what you create does not end at death. The death of what? The death of your personality. The death of your soul? No, that's impossible. Your soul is immortal. You and the universe are one. There's lots of ways of looking at this, but I want to stay practical in our discussion. The Seat of the Soul and Universal Human, these are practical books that discuss how, what can I do when I feel enraged? What can I do when I can't stand my kids anymore? What can I do when this person at work just triggers me and I'm reacting so much I can't even focus on what I'm supposed to do? What can I do when I'm worried about the rent? What can I do? when I'm wondering if I'm in the right relationship, what can I do? In the old consciousness, you try to change 
the external world. That not only doesn't work, it creates pain and destruction. In the new consciousness, you have a new opportunity, a different potential to really experience this pain instead of acting on it, instead of lashing out, instead of eating more, instead of blaming somebody for what you're doing, instead of saying, I can't do it, my neurons are all tangled up now. I've been doing this since I was 12. You might have been doing it since the 4th century. The question is not, when did you start experiencing pain? You've always experienced pain. That's the nature of the earth school. It's called a school, not a resort. <laughs> And I didn't name it. That reflects its function. Its function is to learn love. And to learn love requires challenging fear. And challenging fear requires becoming aware of it in you. One of the people that we've worked with for 15 years now, I mean, we, we love everyone that we've worked with, but she's in our, uh, she's in, on a support team that supports all the things we're doing. And I remember when she first started, she was one of the first people that came to one of our first events, she said, after she'd been doing this for about a year and a half, she said, I knew I was screwed up, but I didn't know I was this screwed up. <laughs> well, I wouldn't put it in those terms, but I understand what she's saying. Because as you start to develop emotional awareness, you become aware of your emotions. And the first thing you become aware of is fear. There's so much fear in us, and it's painful, and it drives us to every destructive behavior, angry word, judgmental thought that we have ever encountered in ourselves or drawn to us from others. And as I mentioned earlier, the universe doesn't look in terms of what you should do and you shouldn't do or what you will do. It doesn't burden you with a destiny. It gives you potential. And the new consciousness is showing us entirely new potential. The potential to love. The potential to change our lives. In other words, multisensory perception allows us to begin to experience so many of the things that we required faith to believe in. And it doesn't matter what background, religious, agnostic, atheistic, what culture you come from. This is a species-wide transformation to human consciousness, not in human consciousness, to human consciousness. We are now being given, it's not a matter of being able to experience different content of consciousness, different experiences. What's changed is what we can experience. That's what makes this time unprecedented. A magnificent time to be alive. I wish that every person had you in their ears. And thank God you've been so successful and so many people have had this wisdom poured into them. I have so many things I want to ask you, but one thing I want to make sure to ask you is this time that we keep talking about that you talk about in your new book, this, this new consciousness, what made this come to light? What was the shift from the old to the new? How did we enter into this era? Uh, some of us gladly, smoothly, others of us resisting, <laughs> pushing away. And by the way, I thank you for again thinking of me as a source of wisdom that people don't have but they do. You do. This wisdom doesn't come from me. It comes from the universe. And you are part of the universe. Everyone is a part of the universe. Everyone in the Earth School has a non-physical teacher or teachers. That's with a capital T. Your intuition is one of the ways you can connect with your non-physical teacher. Uh, intuition is the voice of the non-physical world. So I'm going to suggest to you a foolproof way to connect with a non-physical world. Before you act or speak next time, and especially if you're not sure about it, ask yourself, what is my intention? And you will not be alone in your answer. It may not come to you 
immediately, but it will come. And this brings us to intention. But we can stay here with an intuition for a while because I am not a source of wisdom that you don't have. I am a source of wisdom that I don't have. <laughs> I love how you said before you corrected me in a, in a beautiful way. I loved it. It was a second and I took it in and I said something about the field and you said, it's not in the field, it's inside of you. And I think that that's so powerful. And I spent a week with Joe Dispenza a few months ago and I heard him say at the end of the retreat, he said to us, you know, you want to know why God is hidden because he's inside of every one of us. And it's the last place we <laughs> choose to look. And so that mystical, that portal is inside of us. And you continue to remind us of that. Thank you. Thank you. I was like, Linda and I were adopted uh, by our Sioux brother into the Lakota tradition years ago. And, and they have so many tales. I love them. And one of them is the creator had assembled all of creation. And he said, I want to hide something from the humans that they, are cre that they create. They are the creators of their world. What should I do? And the eagle said, give it to me. I'll take it to the moon. They'll never find it there. And the creator said, no, one day they'll go to, even to the moon and they'll find it. And the bear said, give it to me. I'll take it into the mountains. They'll never find it there. And the creator said, no, one day they'll tunnel through the mountains and they'll find it. And after so many of the creatures had given their ideas, a mole, mother mole, said, rose to speak and everyone knew that she was wise because she had no eyes she looked inward and she said put it inside them <laughs> and the creator said oh it is done It's really so beautiful and I mean it's really what drives me to do whatever I'm doing and um, it's fascinating how often everyone's asking me asking our guests asking the question what do I do how do I get from here to there and there's this this presupposition that all these circumstances and everything in the environment dictates what will happen. And so what do I do with all of this as if there's no power inside of us to create the world around us? Experiment with some other suppositions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because the ones you're experimenting with aren't working. Actually, they're working beautifully, but what they're creating is not what you want. What you want is the joy of fulfillment. What you want is love, to give, to share. That's what frightened parts of your personality want. So when you feel these cravings, these needs, these inadequacies, those are the fear-based parts of your personality. The love-based parts are there. And by aligning yourself with them, you align yourself with what the fear-based parts want so much. Uh, I'm glad you enjoyed that. Uh, that event with Joe, we met him some time ago and like him a lot. Oh, I'm sure uh, that you guys would be fast friends. Yes, and, easily. Uh, and uh, I'd suggest another event that you go to. It's, Linda and I are giving it this July. It's called The Journey to the Soul. Where is it? It's online. Oh, I have that in my notes. It's a five-day retreat, July 21st. Everybody, I'll put the link in the show notes. Absolutely, we have to go. That makes talking. it so easy. Yes, yes. Well, it makes it easy to get to the event. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> no, when you get to the event, we're going to be talking about and practicing. This is important, practicing. Because the books are good. And our talk that we're doing now is helpful. But it's the practice yeah. that brings this into your life. 
And before we leave, or in whatever time we have left, I want to touch on intention because it's, it's the most important thing. An intention is a quality of consciousness that infuses your deeds and your words. And it is the intention that you hold when you act and when you speak that creates consequences, not the act and not the word. For example, imagine two people walking, hiking. They're walking down a one-track trail. And, one of the, and they're talking. And they're getting animated. And suddenly one of them pushes the other off the trail and down into the bushes. Now, if you were watching this like a video, you'd say, what happened there? They must have been talking about politics or religion. And one <laughs> couldn't stand what the other was saying and pushed that person off the trail. But what if you were with them and you saw that the one who pushed saw that her friend was walking directly toward a rattlesnake. Right. It's the same action, isn't it, Kathy? Yeah. The push, the shove, the fall. But the intention was one of love. Yeah. And the first assumption was the intention was one of fear. Mm -hmm. So you can say wise things, I can say wise things, and if I'm doing it to make myself feel better, adopt a persona of a wise person because it makes me feel better. That's still the pursuit of external power because I'm trying to change other people so I'll feel better about myself. As you look at your life in the earth school, you can think that there are countless intentions. I want to go to New York. I want to get married. Uh, I want to go water skiing. I want to have dreadlocks down to my waist. I want to have him for a partner. I've got to have him. I've got to have her. But if you, I've got to make more money. That's a common one. I need a new job. But ask yourself why. Why? Why? Why do you want a jo new job? To make more money. Why do you want to make more money? I want to buy a Ferrari. Why do you want to buy a Ferrari? I'll get some sex. People will appreciate me. Why do you want to have sex and have people appreciate you? And you keep going and going, why, why? Until you get to the bedrock, can't get any deeper. And it'll be love or fear. That means I want something from somebody else, from the world. That's the pursuit of external power. Or the bedrock intention is love. I want to give my gifts. I am giving my gifts. This is what it feels like. So until you can identify wow. I want to I don't want to cut you off. I want to ask no, you another please. question. Yes, of course. Well, I want to ask you is about, you know, that's it's just I, I need another word besides powerful because it, it's so powerful what you're saying. What I find about love is that when it comes down to it, the people that I have met, there is a shame they feel in receiving. So they want it so much. And yet, whenever there could be a moment for them to receive, whether it's that someone wants to pay them for their artwork, or whether it's that somebody wants to tell them what it is that their work has meant to them. There is a way in which people push away the, the receiving. It's, it's almost like it's painful. Like there's a feeling of who am I to deserve? And so there's this loop that goes on where they crave love. They want to give love. And then when it's coming in, there's this, who am I to have this and then push it right back away as opposed to feeling that there is almost a humility in receiving love so that therefore we could be maybe a lightning rod for more of that, to be a conduit for more of that. It feels as though I want to be a nice person, a good person, therefore I should receive less. Who am I to have so much? Who am I to, to, to 
to receive from my partner, from my friends, from, I see this so often. I'm curious, how do we, how do we learn to receive that love? By unearthing all of the parts of your personality, including the one that you've just described that blocks you from loving or receiving love. Whenever you are blocking love from someone else or your, your own love to someone else, that's when you feel pain. That's when you feel pain in your energy processing system. That's when energy leaves you in fear and doubt instead of in love and trust. So as you go through the earth school, what you are deciding moment by moment is what your experiences in the earth school will be. How will you learn wisdom? Through love and trust or through fear and doubt? That's your choice. That's always your choice. And the universe will not punish you for choosing one, <clears throat> pardon me, or reward you for choosing another. You have chosen an if, a cause and it will create an effect. And so it goes. And so it will go. So if you keep asking me or someone keeps asking you, how can I do this? I don't feel worthy. And you, and you say to them, but you are worthy. You're beautiful. They're not going to hear it because they're in a frightened part of their personality. And from that perspective, they are not worthy. The frightened part is not worthy. And it's never going to feel worthy. If you keep trying to change that part of your personality, you'll be doing it several lifetimes down the road. What you can do is recognize that part of your personality. Recognize that that unworthy part or experience is not coming from the unchangeable ground of your being. It's coming from a part of your personality, one part, and you have many parts. You have a part that's loving. You have a part that's happy to be alive, that's in joy. You have a part that's cringing when somebody says, calls your name. You have a part that doesn't want to get out of bed in the morning. And you have a part that's homicidal, a part that's genocidal, a part that's suicidal. Everyone has all these parts. And if you're frightened to look at any of them, it will control you and continue to control you. So as you unearth all of the parts of your personality, you put yourself in a position to choose. As you're exploring a fear-based part of your personality, you create a little distance, a gap between an impulse and your action on it. And in that gap, you can do the most important thing. You can choose consciously. Every time you act, you're acting on an intention. But if you're not aware of that intention, it will create destructively. That's another way of saying if you're not aware of that intention, you will be creating unconsciously. And your unconscious creations are always painful. In other words, it's not as though you didn't have an intention. The effects that your intention created were exactly what you intended, but you didn't know what you intended. That's why it's a nice thing to be able to ask a non-physical teacher What's my intention? I'm about to tell this person, you're a great guy. You're a marvelous woman. You will be appreciated eventually. Then you ask yourself, what's my intention? Is it love or is it fear? Now this is a sophisticated question because in this case, it brings up a fearful part of the personality that caretakes. A caretaker. There's a difference between caretaking and caregiving. Caretaking is doing something that appears to be giving. It appears to be loving. It appears to be supportive. But actually, the care, the care that is being offered comes with strings attached. There's a second agenda. And the second agenda is appreciation or gratitude or at least acknowledgement. And there's a lot of people in the helping profession that are caretakers because they haven't yet developed the ability to distinguish between the frightened and loving parts of their personalities. 
because that is what tells you when love is active in you and what is, and when fear is. If you have painful physical sensations in your ener energy processing centers, fear is present and active. And the opposite, when love is present. So, for example, how would you feel if you went shopping for a friend? He's someone you like, you've known for a long time, and you want to give him a really nice gift. So you go to a really nice store and you get him a really nice tie that you think would just be perfect for him. Or if he doesn't wear ties, you get him a pair of running shoes that are the latest and neat. And you bring him back and you can hardly wait. And then when the occasion comes, you say, I love you, here. And he takes your gift and looks at it and says, another tie? Seriously? I've already got 38 of them. And I don't even like this one. Do you feel anything inside? Does it cause a little twinge? A little pain? And when you really explore that, you'll be really exploring a painful part of your personality that is in that moment, judging, is frustrated, angry, resentful, and creating distance. All that happens continually with people. So you can know your intention. You ask if this is doable, and I say to you and to everyone listening, it's doable. It's doable. And every time you say to yourself, I don't think so, you're listening to a frightened part of your personality, and that is where you can make a choice. Every time you say, what can I do to change the world? There's so many people that aren't going to change. You disempower yourself. Every frightened part of your personality disempowers you. And as you start to recognize them and challenge them and move beyond their control, and that's where your choice enters the picture. To make a responsible choice is to make a choice that will create consequences for which you are willing to assume responsibility. And that choice is always one of love or fear. And if you are experiencing fear, when you recognize it, it will take your courage. It will take your commitment to do something so completely different than to lash out, judge, blame, create distance, become a victim again. You can contribute differently to the world. And right now, that's the only thing that can change the world. It appeared otherwise to five sensory humans and still does. But as you become multi-sensory, you see that this world that we inhabited from five sensory humans is a world of external power. You can see it in our interactions. You see it in yourself. You look around you. You see our social structures crumbling and disintegrating. That's in the in universal human too because they're all based on and express and teach external power. And the new social structures that will replace them will reflect and express the values of the soul. Harmony, cooperation, sharing, and reverence for life. And all of that will replace the values of the personality. Discord, competition, hoarding, exploitation. Which would you prefer in your life? Those are the two different worlds we talked about at the beginning of our talk. It's your choice. Everything, the only thing that stands between you and what you want, the only thing that stands between you and all that's satisfying and fulfilling, the only thing that stands between you and love are matters of choice. Your choice. Listening to you uh, speak, it's, it's like music. It's like listening to an incredible symphony. And it's, it's so mind blowing. I feel so humbled and honored that I got, I grew so much just in real time listening to you speak and feeling so much like feeling, you know, sort of like the coherence of things coming together. So thank you so much. Tell us where, um, where we can buy the book. I know it comes out June 22nd, I believe. 
That's and right. uh, and tell us where we can find it and where we can follow you and sign up for the journey to the soul retreat and everything else. Okay, you can uh, buy the book. You can pre-order the book at universalhuman.com. And I'm sending you there. I'd probably send you to Amazon or another place, but but I mean, of, of course, you just click a link. But I want you to see universalhuman.com because it'll give you a glimpse of what our new website's going to look like and will be available uh, before the book is launched. Awesome. Uh, uh, the one we have now is informational. We had it built a long time ago. This one is supportive because Linda and I are in the last years of our lives and we want to support people even more than ever. And we want to leave something like an ecosystem with a website and podcast and uh, uh, social media and online courses that people can come to. And that is going to be the new website. Now the address of it is seatofthesoul.com. It's the name of the book. And you can go there and you can download the Authentic Power Guidelines and there's things on it that'll be helpful. But I can hardly wait to show you the new website. I can hardly wait until um, I have and, and until I have the Universal Human podcast. And by the way, Kathy, maybe you'll be my guest on the Human Universal. Oh my Human God, podcast. Gary! I can't believe you just said that. I would I would be there in a second. I I just love you so much. I just I I feel like anyone who meets you loves you because you you bring us you you love us into life. You know, you give us more of our life force. Kathy, that's because I haven't been in a power struggle with you yet. A frightened part of my personality hasn't come to interact with you like it does in every human. Now the question is, can you love someone who's in a power struggle with you? Can you love someone who's brutal? Can you love someone who's a, an executioner? Can you love someone who's avaricious? Can you love someone who exploits? Yes, you can. As you align your personality with your soul, yeah. you acquire, you develop, the four characteristics of an authentically powerful personality, humbleness, clarity, forgiveness, and love. Love is the big one. Love is what you're learning how to do. And the final step in creating authentic power is giving your power over to a higher power. There is no higher power than love. That's the path we're all on. And we're on it together. We're on it together. Thank you so much. Thank you for all of it. Thank you. I'm so blessed to have spent today with you. Well, thank you, Kathy. And I'm so looking forward to, uh, I'll see you at the event. I invite all of our listeners We'll do it to together. Register for that event, the seat of the soul. And I invite you all to uh, experiment with a, a Universal Human podcast. We haven't really discussed Universal Human, but I know you're going to love it. Do we have enough well, time? So to... much of what we, t what we talked about in authentic power and new consciousness is I, I know this is what Universal Human is addressing. It is because creating authentic power is not a shortcut or the inside track to the universal human. It's required. Universal humans emerge out of authentically powerful humans. And that's what we're learning how to do. A universal human is authentically powerful. And we're in the process of learning how to do that, each for ourselves. But in support of one another, that's spiritual partnership. We'll talk about that next time. Partnership between equals for the purpose of spiritual growth, for the purpose of supporting one another, not doing it for one another because that's impossible, but supporting one another. A universal human is beyond culture, beyond religion, nation, ethnic group, and gender. A universal human whose allegiance is to life first and everything else second. Universal human, the book, is dedicated to emerging universal humans. And I love talking with emerging universal humans. And you are one. And so many of our listeners are one. And that's what we'll explore. 
what that feels like. And there's some examples of emerging universal humans in the book. It's a very practical book. And it does cover authentic power because you have to be authentically powerful. As, as you create authentic power, you move toward the universal human. It's so gorgeous. Thank you so much. Thank you for all of it. Uh, this whole conversation, I think safely I can say people are so filled up. We will all be getting this book. If you haven't read his prior books, definitely go get them. I will put links to all of it. And I will also sign up for this retreat and have, I will, I will put the link so we can all do it together. Oh, that's splendid. I'm so looking forward to seeing you at the event. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay. Thank you for making it possible. You're very welcome. Thank you, Gary. Have such a blessed, such a joy. You're the best. Thank you.